webinar. Our seminar will continue to be held virtually through WebEx until December 2nd. For those of you attending our live presentation today, it'd be great if you could please type into the chat box where you are joining us from, uh, including your program name and your location so we can get a sense of who is tuning in. You can also type questions into the chat box during the talk and I will relay them to Dr. Beckman at the end of her presentation. And before we get started, if everyone could please take a second to make sure that their microphone is muted, that would be great. I'm honored to introduce Dr. Nancy Beckman, Assistant Professor of Clinical Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at the University of Chicago. Dr. Beckman received her PhD from my school, Rosalind Franklin. She completed her internship at the University of Chicago Medical Center and her postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Beckman's clinical and research work has focused on coping with and adjusting to chronic medical illness, health behavior change, anxiety disorders, and behavioral medicine integration. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Beckman to present on health psychology within primary care. Thank you, Isha. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so as Isha said, I'm at the University of Chicago, and I um, started the process along with a great team of other people and um, really great trainees, um, the process of trying to help integrate our primary care um, clinic in 2015. So it's been about five years and, um, you know, we've had some ups and downs. And so a lot of the information that I talk about today comes from some of those experiences. Um, um, a lot of it also comes from, I think, in the very beginning when we got started, you know, the question is like, how do we even do this? What, what, do, what do we do? Um, and so a lot of what I learned came from the University of Massachusetts Medical School's Integrated Care Pro Certificate course. It was taught by Alexander Blount in 2015, which was really helpful, and I, I recommend that course. Um, and then many of some of the slides you'll see um, and some of the presentation is also adapted from Division 38's Society for Health Psychology's Integrated Primary Care Curriculum, which is a freely available four-part series and is really great. It's something that um, we show all of our um, primary care um, trainees as we start every year. To, I think it, it, it summarizes really well what it means to, to work in an integrated way. So, okay. Um, so this is just an outline of today's talk. First, I'm going to just review the rationale and the goals for why integrated primary care. And I think a lot of times I feel as if I'm preaching to the choir when I'm talking to a group of mental health professionals about this, um, when we talk about like what's the need for this. But I think that, you know, a review of the information is also really useful as a way to be able to sort of, for everyone to get um, better at explaining it, you know, you need to be able to explain that rationale when you're trying to get buy-in and to prove why this is important um, to administrators or other stakeholders to get them to be willing to allocate resources in this direction. Um, I'll discuss some of the features of primary care and then also talk about the many roles a psychologist can play in this setting with a focus on some of the clinical skills and what, what it might look like. And then just touch on some of the diversity and ethical issues that are sort of unique to practicing in this setting. And if hopefully if there's time, we can do case examples or questions. Um, I tend to, I like to pack it just in case but we can make decisions as we go along. Um, so to begin, mental health problems are highly prevalent in primary care. Right? So most patients who have a mental health needs are actually treated in primary care versus in specialty mental health. So you may have seen the statistic before that 70% of patients get their treatment in primary care versus 30% who have a mental health issue who end up getting care in a specialty mental health setting. And and so on top of that, we know that um, still many mental health problems are going undiagnosed or are inadequately treated. Um, so this is especially true if routine screening isn't in place or if providers aren't trained on how to look for and assess and, and what to do, right, once they identify it. And also that inadequate treatment is a concern that so perhaps somebody, um, you know, they noticed depression or talked about it once, may have been started on something and no one's ever followed up. Do they still need this medication? Is it at its effective dose? Do they need a switch? So a lot of times we see sort of inadequate treatment. There's an estimate that less than 33% receive minimally adequate treatment for their mental health care. 
right? So, so if a mental health problem is recognized right, and if a referral is made, then the issue of lack of access to outpatient mental health is a huge problem. 66% um, of primary care physicians say that they can't access um, outpatient mental health and that up to 90% of referrals, and this number is so staggering to me, um, so if, if all of this happens, somebody's finally identified and a referral is made, up to 90% um, result in no appointment being made. Um, so it's a huge problem. And, and this is especially true for racial and ethnic minorities um, who are less likely to follow through to specialty mental health. The Office of the Surgeon General says that um, they're less likely to incline to then whites to seek treatment for mental health specialists. And studies indicate that minorities turn more often to primary care. As a, um, so it's a, it's a better cultural fit for many people. So it's there. Right? And untreated mental health problems then pose many problems for patients and for the healthcare system. So we know that many medical presentations have psychological comorbidity. So for example, rates of depression, anxiety are higher among the medically ill. And when conditions like diabetes, heart disease, pain, asthma are com comorbid with an untreated mental health condition, they are usually then associated with poor outcomes. So Untreated mental health is associated with usually poor compliance, um, and it's often one of the causes behind medically unexplained symptoms, which, you know, when patients are sort of coming back and maybe lots of tests are being run, which is something that can be really taxing on providers, patients, and the medical system. So high utilizers tend to have comorbid presentations. So they say that there's 10% of the patients who use 70% of the resources. Um, untreated mental health, for example, can lead to double the cost. So controlling for medical problems, patients with depression, for example, tend to utilize three times more healthcare services, incur twice the medical cost, make seven times the ER visits. So comorbid presentations, so this mental health issue associated with medical issues, are associated with poor outcomes and higher mortality and higher cost. So it's a prevalent issue. We know it's there. It leads to higher, more problems, insufficient care, higher costs. And so something needed to be done about it. And so to address some of the problems of access and to improve the healthcare system, the movement to bring behavioral health services into primary care so has increasingly gained momentum over the last few decades. Um, this is a, a general definition of integrated primary care. Um, it's care that from a team of primary care and behavioral health clinicians who are working together with patients, sometimes families, um, to address any of the many different problems that patients might bring to the primary care setting. Um, so stress-related physical symptoms, maladaptive health behaviors, acute chronic mental health conditions, substance misuse. Um, Alexander Blount said that, you know, so for any problem, patients have come to the right door. Um, truly integrated primary care occurs when, you know, they're, they're, they're truly linked um, when the behavioral health care or the mental health care is just an integral part of the medical treatment um, with there being a single um, treatment plan in place. And there's different models have been proposed and revised. Probably the two most popular are the collaborative care and with a lot of research behind them are the collaborative care model. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that in the primary care behavioral health model. Within the VA, we use the primary care mental health integration, which sounds to me a lot like the primary care be health, behavioral health model. Um, but the basics of the collaborative care model, um, so that, again, is team-driven care, which, which is population-focused. So this isn't necessarily care only to some. It's, we're really trying to manage the whole population. It's measurement-guided. It's evidence-based. So usually... Um, Usually we're working with a psychiatrist um, and a care manager, and there there's the use of some evidence-based screening measure, for example, like the PHQ-9, to, to screen the entire population and then contain that data within a registry. Um, and then we're, you know, treating to target. We, we want to see with the goal of improving clinical outcomes for that population. Um, and it's typically stepped care. So the care manager might call somebody in and offer them, um, I think it's a, we can kind of use the example of the impact study to, to talk about what the collaborative care model is. So um, the impact study 
was a large, so really landmark study around collaborative care. Um, and in it, um, so IMPACT was improving mood and promoting access to collaborative treatment. Um, about 1,800 depressed older adults from 18 clinics, so the clinics over, you know, across the country. Um, so half of the patients in the study were randomly assigned to receive care that's normally available within the primary care clinic. So um, for 70% of those patients, that's like medications um, and or referrals. So what normally happens when a person has a mental health issue. Um, the other half of patients were randomly assigned to receive the impact model of care. Um, so collaborative care with the PCP, the behavioral health case manager, and the consultation of the psychiatrist. Um, so the case manager is managing, managing the registry, alerting the PCP if patients aren't progressing, um, and offers brief counseling um, using evidence-based techniques like motivational interviewing, problem solving, um, behavioral activation. Um, usually um, weekly or biweekly contacts for eight to 12 weeks. Um, so we're trying to see if we can improve the targeted patients in that time. If that doesn't work, then they might switch um, to another method or make a change and see how that goes for 10 weeks. Um, and so whenever patients, if they're not improving as expected, um, changes, they, they might review it and make changes then. But so at 12 months in this study, following treatment in this way, um, about half the patients receiving the collaborative care reported at least a 50% reduction in their depressive symptoms compared with only 19% of those in usual care. So that's, that's quite a difference. Um, and then even after the trial ended, um, patients were followed for two years, the patients in the impact arm had 100 more depression-free days over the next two years. Um, so that's really remarkable. Um, so there's a lot of research and support around the collaborative care model. Um, the primary care behavioral health model, sort of the model that we're using um, currently within our integration. So um, again, that's collaborative, typically co-located or integrated within the primary care clinic. So that's where mental health professionals or behavioral health consultants tend to be the term that's used, are working side by side with members of the medical team. So the primary care physician, the nurses, the other staff. Um, it's really same day services often, so warm handoffs are sort of a hallmark. That's where um, somebody, you know, if an issue is identified with a patient at any point, right, at check-in or um, when, when they're being groomed or with the primary care physician, that they might call in a behavioral health consultant to come and to help the patient deal with that particular issue or address that problem. Um, and, and then they might set up continued care, but it's, it's, within, it's within primary care. And so one of the benefits of practicing in that way, it's really supposed to help promote systemic change within the primary care practice itself so that by working side by side, you're really learning from each other. So we're helping to sort of empower the primary care providers and everyone else with sort of that basic level of, of mental health care so that they're getting better at recognizing it and providing some of the basic um, first level interventions, learning how to talk about it in a non-stigmatizing way, those kinds of things. I like to include here, and I believe that um, Dr. Adrian Williams was one of the people who talked, um, who talks in this series um, about the patient-centered health pelvic exam. Last year, she, um, I think right before I, I did this talk last year, um, well, her, an article that she wrote came out about the next step in integrated care, universal primary mental health providers. So that is where she advocates for just like everyone has a PCP and they have, they, you know, insurance pays for regular checkups, um, that we might have a universal primary mental health provider, like your primary care provider. Um, and it's really to help sort of reduce the stigma that there has to be something wrong with you to have a mental health problem, um, that it's not normal, right? So we don't want this, as you talked about, not having that, that false dichotomy of there being a mental health problem or not. Um, and um, so it's, it's, it's really forward thinking, and I, I like this idea. So if we're talking about the, the way things have progressed, um, you know, over the last few decades with increasing integration for me, just definitely over the last five years while I've been here, and then thinking about, you know, I, I wonder if Dr. Williams was on to something. Um, okay. So we thought how the goal of integrated um, primary care is often referred to, initially it was the triple aim, but now they talk about the quadruple aim. So triple aim was the best care at the lowest cost for the whole population. 
the um, quadruple aim, so that was sort of added added there quickly, was also delivered by healthy providers. So, you know, paying attention to the fact that we also want to reduce burnout and the ne negative implications of overworked stress providers. Um, and I think when I think about one of the um, benefits of integrated care and one of the experiences of us having being present within um, the primary care um, work rooms, um, and, and this is, so there's been a lot of changes with COVID, which perhaps we could talk about at the end, um, where we're not present on site in the same way, in part because, you know, I think their space is really limited in primary care and they're trying to keep everybody safe distance and those kinds of things. So we're doing lots of Zoom. We have um, um, made available sort of just like a Zoom link. So the attending on call for like, I'm on my clinics, I have an extra Zoom link so that if any of the PCPs need consultation, we can provide consultation that way. Um, and we're doing more urgent appointments where we're filling them in, but we're not sort of going into patient rooms. So this sort of, we're adapting. I shouldn't think people all over the country and the world are finding different ways to adapt to the situation. Um, but one of the things that we do recognize um, in practicing in this more integrated way is also that uh, how um, needed we are and how much sometimes, you know, when, when a PCP is encountering a patient who's having a mental health crisis or says, makes a passive suicidal reference or is crying um, or something like that, right, that to, to, to be able to bounce that off of, of us or to have talked with us in the past, um, because that might not have been their area of expertise. That wasn't necessarily something that they were trained for in the same way that we are. Um, it ah, makes them feel so much better. So they always feel like their stress level just kind of goes down a bit. And we get lots of appreciation for us being there when they're feeling uncomfortable, when they're uncertain about something. And then if we're able to consult or they are with us, right, in a joint visit, then they've learned something. And we do a lot of work in terms of um, trying to train the residents and doing other didactics, again, for that whole, um, for that idea of trying to train up the whole practice. And so there's positive outcomes for practicing in this way. And, and so these slides with um, the nice graphic, these are part of the slides that come from the Division 38 um, Integrated Primary Care Series. So check those out. Um, so, you know, consistent with the triple aim, we see that hospitalizations and emergency department visits, the use of the higher cost, high intensity care decreases, adherence, screening increases, um, patient visits to primary care, right, rather than those higher costs to increase. Um, patient satisfaction tends to increase. And so this is an interesting slide that um, gives us just a little bit of information of the overview of the full continuum of integration. So at the one end, the continuum is completely separate or siloed behavioral health, and at the other end is more integrated care. Um, and so level six, right, so we're going from level one to level six is that model for seamlessly integrated care. I just want you to kind of look through that slide and notice some of the differences in the level of communication between the disciplines, right? Um, so is it something that we're only minimally talking to each other or are we fully merged, right? Is it, is it just regular that I am, you are working with me uh, seamlessly? Um, or are we just very closely collaborating? Are we occasionally talking to one another? Um, and within facilities, right? So how do the facilities, are they different? So are you siloed? Are you in different places? Are you in the same facility, but not necessarily the same offices? So um, um, within the same space, are you in the same workroom? Um, are you fully, you know, utilized? Even sometimes I think, you know, as I've trained as a health psychologist, I've been in different settings, you know, especially in my training in other places, and, and it's really easy to practice siloed care in a co-located way, right? So, you know, you get some room. I think especially when I was a trainee, you'd find some space somewhere in one of the, the other departments, right? When I moved to a specialty department, you might find a, like the library. I think I did counseling in a library at some point. Um, it was really still removed, right, from the clinic flow. Um, and so I could just go see my patients and leave, and I really wouldn't have to interact with other other people. So that's a, sort of that idea that even though you're siloed, you you know, even if you move to co-location, you can still be quite um, separate. So that goal of on, on communication, not just physical proximity, but also the practice change, right? How how do those things change over time? 
Did they say like the most, the highest degrees of integration tend to occur in community health centers, um, the FQHCs, um, or really large organizations that like where the both the provider, the insurance company, where all of that, VAs, um, large university-based hospitals. Um, I think that when I, if I were to judge what where, where we are, we're we're somewhere here. We're somewhere between co-located and integrated. Um, or, you know, in, in some ways, we, I think, on, on different markers, we're in different places. We talk, these are some suggestions about how to grow a practice and move it from one level to the next. And I think this is really useful, I think, for some people who are thinking about, well, how do I reach out? How do I start to do this? Or how do I take our practice maybe to the next step? Um, so really conducting a needs assessment on which populations or issues are most needed. Um, really becoming part of the formal and informal primary care culture. So when I say that in a lot of ways, you can practice siloed care even when you're in a different setting. I think this is one of the one of the things I mean, right? So we don't want to just be seen as the outsider mental health person, right? So if we're really trying to integrate, we're, we're going to the clinical operations meetings, we're going to the grand rounds, we're chatting, right? We're attending each other's baby showers and those kinds of things. Um, we're really part of the of the culture. Um, we're seen as a member of the team. Um, and and I think another sort of mark of that is more warm handoffs, right? And that's really where I think when I say that physicians can be grateful or other staff members can be really grateful for our presence, but especially in the warm handoffs. Like they had a need for us right there, and, and there we were, right? And, and we can talk about what we did and, and how that worked for everybody. Um, this is um, data from... Um, a study that our group did, um, so Aaron Stab um, in 2018. So one of the things that we've done um, under the direction of Dr. Latira Pong, so we'd say that getting a physician champion is so important. So when we're talking about how do we, you know, merge those cultures as a psychologist being like being one of the outsiders, right, within a primary care place, making sure that I have partners on the other side who can who can help translate maybe some of my ideas into the realities of that situation as well. Um, so, so we work as a team, a team with, um, with, with primary care physicians, with some of the psychiatry leadership, um, the psychologists, Dr. Araujo, Dr. Fabiana Araujo is um, we've hired a, a full-time primary care psychologist. So she's, she is there with, with us and, and then our other staff, right? All of the people who are contributing to this. But one of the things we've done, um, is to measure um, using the level of integration measure. So this is looking at different um, on, on different metrics. How well integrated is this particular organization? And so one of the things that I like about Dr. Latera Pong's method is is to she likes to be very um, very focused on continuous quality improvement. And so um, every six months we've delivered the survey to all all of the providers and and staff. Um, asking them how they feel about all different areas around system integration, integrated practices, relationships, like beliefs, leadership. Do you feel like the leadership is supporting? You know, do we learn together? Um, and and sort of targets, right, on those areas where we might be lower, um, places where we might need more work, we might then target an intervention or two. So, for example, in training, we've done more work on having more shared trainings. I did a series of lectures to within the clinical operations meetings about ways to handle difficult patients, more communication strategies. Um, we're involved in a precept clinic. Um, so we're teaching the PGY1s who, right as they advance, then um, will kind of take some of those skills and be really used to working with us um, as they, you know, by, by, by the end of their time there. And, so, and then we sort of remeasure to see, are we, are we moving closer and closer um, to these goals? That's a nice way of going about it, I think, and that's also been able to sort of produce some, you know, papers and lots of posters. Um, so, um, provision of primary care behavioral health services differs in key ways from specialty mental health. Some of this is sort of, um, I think, so obviously, if we're just kind of looking at this slide, right, on-site services in real time versus patients having to find and then access services. Um, siloed versus very team, interdisciplinary team. There's more of opportunities for prevention and early intervention. So the differences in um, 
practice itself is that with an integrated care, um, we're really focusing on brief interventions. And again, this is because we're keeping the population in mind. If we were to do long-term, very involved therapy with every patient trying to fix everything, um, we would not, there's no way you have the resources to be able to do that for the population. So we're really focusing, um, um, and, but on, on more than just mental health, right? So that's another difference, um, health behaviors, substance misuse, any any issue that, that a person might bring, you know, fired from their job, an incident at work, right? That sometimes we see patients in urgent care who just had an incident at work and now they had to go to urgent care but are really crying or sh shaken up by what just happened, right? That, that might be an opportunity for us to provide a little prevention and talking about, you know, ways for them to cope or what they can do for this so that it doesn't continue to evolve into something where they're at home now, off of work, ruminating about what happened, um, or they're set up, right, for, for a week or two to come back and check in on how they're doing. Um, I think, oops, excuse me. One of the, the bigger differences, and I know that is for me, as somebody who um, was trained in specialty settings, right, and I, I think I work, I, chronic pain is one of my areas of focus, and so I do, you know, comprehensive pain evaluations and pre-surgical evaluations where they're, you know, where we're really identifying, there's like diagnostic clarity. We, we know every possible thing that's happening and all the contributing factors. Um, and it feels good, right, by the end of like an hour and a half or something to have this lovely conceptualization of something. And that, so that was such a huge, and I personally tend to run on the longer side. So, so then, then shifting to primary care where things are so much quicker and fast paced, um, and, and really increasing tolerance for ambiguity and uncertainty. It's like, well, probably a lot more going on there, but this is the issue, right, that you came in here today, and this is the thing that we're going to we're gonna focus on. This is the thing that you need more. So it's a very problem-oriented um, focus versus necessarily a diagnosis-oriented, um, unless I think sometimes diagnosis clarification is a referral question. Um, we can sometimes help on the way to a larger referral. So this slide just provides a broad overview of the range of different clinical services um, and activities performed by psychologists in primary care, screening, prevention. I think screening is something that's just so helpful that I often see when a psychologist integrates. That's one of the things that we've, um, that I think that we uniquely add. Um, collaboration, health behavior interventions, being able to engage the patient and the family, co helping to coordinate care, um, brief brief treatment, um, acute illness management. So as health psychologists, we also, you know, know some things about what are the healthy behaviors that a person might do or what might sort of, um, or, or even working with um, the primary care about what are some of the specific behaviors that is best for this condition. Um, so we're really helping people manage their diseases acutely and chronically, um, and then are also present on site for crises. Um, so as I mentioned, behavioral medicine teaching, program development, systems transformation, research, documentation, um, flexibility, understanding medical culture. These are some of the other roles, the other skills that I think um, you have to draw upon and that you might, might need to use um, as you try to practice in an interdisciplinary setting. So when I talk about um, like documentation, right? So if you're practicing in this more fast-paced way, you have to sort of shift the way your notes look as well. Um, flexibility, um, you know, sometimes you're seeing a patient and there's just, there's just more chaos, <laughs> right, versus your, your, your office um, and kind of having to, to, to roll with it. And then also understanding a little bit about what it means to practice within the medical culture. And I, I think that, you know, medical culture is really fast-paced. They're focused on the bottom line. Um, content, I've heard, more than theory. Um, and so, you know, when you're documenting, when you're providing, you know, information back to the referring physicians, you're, you're trying to speak their language. Um, but at the same time, I, I also think that, you know, it's the idea of full assimilation. Are we fully assimilating within primary care? It's integrated care. It's something new. It's something that is made new in part by the contribution of the psychologist, right? So we're, we, I think we have special skills um, and a frame and, and experiences that we're bringing to the setting, um, and really we don't want to completely lose those either. And so that idea of sort of insight into the psychosocial aspects of illness, or you know, some of those person-centered skills, right? Where we're able to sort of a lot of practice physicians have these too, but 
where you pay, really are doing active listening and reflections and um, to understand what's going on here. Why is this person not compliant? What else is going on? Um, so, you know, I, I think that how do I, I, I often think it's important to try to balance those two about fitting in with the culture, but then still um, bringing in some of the gifts that, that you have. Um, and so I, I think about that within a patient setting is that, you know, I, I need I need for this to go along quickly, <laughs> but at the same time, I don't want that to come at the cost of the patient feeling listened to and understood. So, you know, just you get so much more, right? It's so much more effective if we can do that. And, and when we're there, when this is considered sort of when we're part of a long-term care, we have multiple opportunities to keep trying. And so um, I, we're you know, especially if we're thinking from like a motivational perspective or we might talk to somebody, get build some rapport, get them thinking about something. And as they develop and they get to know us a little bit more often, down the road they might be more and more willing to make changes. Um, so this is, this I've inc included, this is sort of knowing that there's just the supply demand imbalance, right? So there's this huge need for mental health resources. Um, and for us too, you know, we're swamped within within um, primary care. Um, one of our goals is to just raise the behavioral health competencies of all the providers. So we do we do a lot of the, as I said, the behavioral medicine teaching and a lot of creation and sharing of resources so to address common problems. Um, so we've they, we've initiated broad depression screening. Um, it's in line with the U.S. preventative. Services Task Force recommendations. Um, and so initially, MAs would deliver the PHQ-2 to patients when they roomed them. And if that was positive, then they would give them the PHQ-9, and the PCT would have to deal with the results. Um, we've also done, um, Dr. Latera Pong and group have also worked on sort of integrating some of this into my chart, so doing some screening through my chart and, and other um, methods. Um, but but, but the bottom line then is that if you screen for it, then you might you might find it, and then you have to treat it. And so, um, so we get lots of primary care physicians like, oh no, right, <laughs> this patient has um, depression. What do I do about it? And so this is just an example of some of the um, clinical decision support tools that we created. And again, these were created with a group with input from psychiatry um, and and primary care at the same time. Um, what might you do? Where might you send a patient? Um, and this is actually just one page, but I had to put it on two slides. And so on the bottom of that page, right, so if your patient was depressed, what might you start them with? Um, what might be a good option? And so a lot of times as the primary care behavioral health provider, I, I'm present within primary care room, um, first year residents, some people might ask, what do you recommend medication-wise? And um, that's one of the, the competencies that I think you have to become more comfortable with when you're um, working in an integrated setting. But but these kinds of tools really um, make me feel more comfortable because I'm not a prescribing health professional, and I'm, I'm always very clear about that. But um, but I, I do point them to these, right? So, well, based on what you described, let's look at the chart. And so we refer them there, and this also kind of, so that if I'm not there, you're kind of getting people used to looking at the chart. What might be a good a good suggestion? Um, one of the ways that we're trying to continue to improve our um, group is that is is um, also getting collaboration with a psychiatrist too. Um, so a lot of times we're, we're getting the primary care physicians better and better at starting um, medications for common conditions and and even making some even for you know getting them more comfortable even for patients with serious mental illness or bipolar disorder. So we have um, algorithms such as these for those as well. Um, but then um, occasionally, right, when it's a patient with particular conditions or they're on so many medications, it, it, it exceeds the level of comfort of the primary care physician. Um, they need access to psychiatry. And sometimes as a, as a you know, psychologist practicing there, if I've seen this patient and now if I have to struggle to get this person in to see a psychiatrist, it, worrisome sometimes, right? And, and so being able to have a little bit of collaboration with a psychiatrist would be very helpful. And in some ways, that's um, a little bit of a, a mixing of, of the collaborative care and the behavioral health um, models, which, which would be really great. So that's, that's the, the thing we're working on is getting a little bit more consistent collaboration with our psychiatrists. Um, so 
I mentioned that one of the ways psychologists can improve identification of issues is to implement broad-based screening. Um, behavioral health screening helps primary care providers with identifying those concerns that might be less obvious. Um, and so these are some of the ones that, that we use within for our patients. And, and when I say screening, that I think all patients get a, like a PHQ-2 at least or a PHQ-9. The G87 is more and more. Um, for all patients in the primary care um, group, but then for the patients that we see, um, so that might we administer these these measures. So I I like this. This is another. Um, this is the ideal um, sample of how a psychologist might work effectively within that brief time frame. So imagine putting all of that together. Um, you know, so with an, um, so this is an example of an initial consult, right, um, based on the referral reason. How might you pace yourself and how might you spend your time in order to, to end up giving the patient something that's, that's going to be helpful? So we talk about um, introducing your role. So we spend a bit of time introducing our role, understanding the reason for consult. Um, I think that is time well spent. I also spend a little time explaining what this is. I think um, integrated primary care is not something that everybody, all that patients are necessarily familiar with, and so just helping them understand the differences, especially if they, they do have any experience with um, specialty mental health, kind of explaining how, it, how it's different. Um, so that's good, that's time worth spent. So having a, a good introductory spiel is something we I help all of our students um, hone before they go in for their, their first session. Um, then trying to understand the problem, right? So that's the assessment. So that's a big chunk of your time. Um, really but focusing on present symptoms, current functioning. I'm gonna go, in a little, go into a little bit more detail about assessment um, and intervention in the next couple slides. Um, and, then, and then, okay, so these are some of the things that you brought in based on this, like what might be the most important thing or um, what, what did you wanna focus on or, um, they are asking me for suggestions. These are some of the things that I think might be helpful for us to focus on. What do you think? Um, then wrapping up, the wrap up, um, and then giving feedback back to the provider, right? So that idea that if the if provider said, really come talk to my patients about this particular issue, spending a little bit of time, and then going back. Um, that's sort of an ideal time frame. So this is Kirk Strozel, who it does focused acceptance and commitment therapy, which I really, really like. Um, I'm going to minimize this for just a second. I'm going to see if we can um, share this clip because I think he does it so well. So let's see. Um, Can you, um, Isha, can you see this as different than my, um, can you see this act? Yeah, I yeah, can I can see your, I can see your desktop. desktop. But now, but it's, now back it's back to the, back the presentation. presentation. Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah. You can see the uh, primary care physician room? Yep. yep. Okay. Thank you. I have a new computer. I just got it last week with multiple screens, which is so wonderful. And so I haven't fully, uh, you know, assigned screens. So thank you. Um, so let's see. And if I play it, will you be able to hear it? Really? Get his act together. Um, he's divorced and he wants to start dating. Okay. Can you hear that? Yeah, yeah. we can. Okay. Thank you. He has three years sober, and I think he's had a benefit from learning to his skills uh, to help with these problems at this point.
emotional health, how you're adapting to life challenges, stresses, transitions, that type of stuff. And so if any of those things come up during the visit, which they do very often, the doctor can text me and have me come in. So like we're doing today. We're going to chat for 15 or 20 minutes. I'm going to try to get a clear picture of what's going on in your life situation right now. And then together with you, try to come up with a plan. So sometimes that means people want to come back because they think they might be able to build some positive momentum if they meet a few times. Other times people kind of get what they came for, they know what they need to do in their life, and they're done. And they go out and they go out and do it. We'll kind of figure that out at the end when we're uh, done talking to everyone. And I'll meet with Dr. Bill and as you heard. Okay. And kind of brief her on what we talked about. But she's told me a couple things. You were having trouble with anxiety, spending a lot of time kind of by yourself. When did the problems with anxiety start? Okay, I'm going to stop that there, and we're going to stop that share and resume our next share. <laughs> um, so hopefully that wasn't. So the reason I like to show that is, um, as I'm as I'm putting this back here, the reason I like to show that it's it's a good um, example and introduction of um, what you might say for that initial introduction. And you notice a couple of things, right? He's, um, when we think about the warm handoff, he's building off, right? So it's a sort of seamless from his from the primary care physician to the behavioral health consultant, and also really helping set the frame. Like this is what this involves. This is why we're here. Mental and behavioral health are connected, um, and your physical health are connected. And then I'm going to report back to the doctor, right? So some of those issues related to confidentiality, those things that might be different. Um, within for if you're practicing with more focused acceptance and commitment therapy, um, you know, I recommend continuing to watch this um, clip. But um, Kurt Strozel really, I think, and I we do that as well, right? So it's brief therapy. So we always tell patients that you know it's up to five sessions. But I have added and amended what I say in the beginning to say that it could just be one. Some people get what they need out of one. Um, and the reason is that really he talks about sort of setting the expectation. And, and sometimes if you're able to sort of draw a clear enough like, conceptualization, sometimes people are like, okay, I'm going to try that. I can try that in other ways, and I don't necessarily need to keep coming back. Um, so that's useful. So now I'm going to start sharing again. My Looks like it's processing. Are you seeing this? Not, Not yet. yet. Okay. I'm sorry. It's doing a doing a thing. <laughs> um, let me make sure that I don't have anything out in the background that's causing the problem there. Um, let me know as soon as you see something. <laughs> How about that? Um, uh, the share content is connecting. Have you ever seen this before? Have you ever seen like a buffer? Look, when I try to share it, it it's. Um, I stressed I shouldn't I shouldn't have risked it, huh? <laughs> it should go back, hopefully. Yeah. Um, you might want to try um, exiting out of like and the web browser that you had the video playing on, like quitting it, so that maybe that's interfering with your slides. I think you're muted now, Dr. Beckman. Dr. Beckman, I don't think that you're connected to audio. It does we can't hear you, but it doesn't say that you're muted.
Will you tell me what exactly you're seeing? The um, link slide. Okay, and that's it? Yep. Okay. Very good. We'll keep moving on. Thank you, everybody. Sorry for that. I hope that didn't scare anybody. This is the realities of practicing, right, with this new technology. Although we were doing, we've been doing it with the you know, web format for a while. Um, so we can talk a little bit about COVID. I said that we're not in the rooms anymore. We're doing a lot more. We're doing a lot more appointments. We're doing a lot more urgent appointments. And um, we also have a link available for consultation. So a Zoom link available to con for consultation. Um, anyway, so we. Can, used to right? one of the ways I've grown during this is getting trying to breathe through technological difficulties. Um, okay, so so you saw just a little bit of an introduction, um, and so you move from that to a little bit of an assessment. Um, one of the things that we do is really you know focusing, kind of hone in. So how do you go more quickly from a specialty mental health set, set, setting to something um, like this? We're trying to hone in red flags. We're still assessing risk. Um, I think supplementing, that's why we talk about using screens and validated measures, those are helpful. They can help speed along, right? So if the person has already filled out a PHQ, I have a bit of information. Um, trying to focus on the present, pursuing the questions that impact intervention, really being selective um, in the questions that we use. Um, a lot of agenda setting and summaries to help keep moving things along. You can see that um, Dr. Strozel was using the, you know, tell me a little bit how this got started. So I, I often use the three T's, like tell me how did this start, what makes it worse, has, how has it been over time, are the things that you're doing, well, how have you been coping with it, is that working for you? Um, and, you know, often asking just a few questions about like, you know, who makes up your social support, who do you live with, um, what does a typical day look like? Kind of getting a little bit of information on the love, work, play, health, and it, it actually gives, you know, nice, sort of um, summary, so I'm actually able to often bill for a, a diagnostic after a, a shortened visit because I have gotten a bit of a social history and, and other things. Um, but it, by asking these questions, you also know like the impact, right? What are the areas that are getting impacted? Just a little bit of what assessment might look like. Um, it's helpful to have a primary care toolbox and you can keep adding to these resources so that other members of the primary care team can use them too. And really these just help enable the, the appointments to go more smoothly and more efficiently, right? So I know that, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is not a worksheet, right? I'm fully aware of this, but I am also aware that when I have a worksheet and I'm talking about this is panic disorder, here are some treatments for it. So we have some nice ones, especially from the good, the Hunter is a good book, the purple um, primary care book. I have a photo of it at the end. Um, that it just really helps frame the appointment and helps things just move a little bit more quickly. And so those can be very helpful. Um, having, um, we have got a, a nice, um, so in the toolbox, like have, and, and we talked about how making these available to all the providers as well, grief, caregiver stress, those are some of the common ones. We've been um, sort of our resources, right? So I think this is one of the big differences, I, perhaps from per practicing at the VA to practicing where we are. But, you know, our Department of Psychiatry is relatively small. When we identify a patient with a higher need who needs more than just what we have in, in primary care, it, we really have to sometimes, you know, sometimes we can send them to our Department of Psychiatry for longer-term therapy or for medication, but not always. Sometimes there's, um, you know, insurance differences or wait lists or whatever. And so, you know, one of the differences is that we've done a lot of work in trying to to make partners with different people in the community so that we have more reliable resources so that we can send our, our, our people there um, without having to look up that information each time. So that's really made a big difference. Although lately, with even with, with COVID, because I think mental health care utilization seems to have increased, at least that's the case for my caseload. Um, but even among all of these partners that we've kind of hooked up with, a lot of them are saying, oh, we're full too. Um, so, so we're having to keep doing that. Um, and the other, um, having to find more, <laughs> um, the other thing that we have a lot of is phone apps. So that's something that I, I actually love to hear more, and sort of adding to that all the time. Um, pro you know, I, I send lots of people to Insight Timer or Stop, Rethink or Headspace, sort of mindfulness meditation apps. Um, sometimes use them for multiple, sort of, um, multiple purposes, the so virtual hope box was one as well. MetaSafe is sort of an, a medication reminder, and so sometimes, helping a person like put this app on their phone and setting up like a commitment to not pressing snooze. That's what I, we, we talk about with the MetaSafe, 
not you're not going to turn you're not going to turn it off. You're only going to press snooze, snooze. See if you can try that and how that changes your medication use. Um, so developing lots of resources can help, especially if we think this is a brief setting. We're trying to give the patient something. And hopefully they'll be able to use it, you know, on their own. Um, interventions. We're we're trying to effectively use current evidence-based interventions to help treat both primary, you know, health, mental health related issues, clarifying the diagnosis. So if a patient has seen me and that's what, what we've done is clarified diagnosis and come up with kind of giving them my idea of what are some things that could be helpful for them. If I never see them again, so we've done some research on the patients who come, like the mode is one of the number of sessions patients have. Um, you know, did they get something? Have I planted some seeds for them in that session so that at some point later, if maybe they are ready to address it or, you know, that they, they kind of know what to look for. So we provide lots of psychoeducation, and we're always trying to do this in, in a very motivationally enhanced style. Um, behavioral activation is a um, very, very common um, strategy that we're using, especially because I think we're seeing lots of patients with depression. Um, when, when, when we talk about how depression is, is so prevalent within primary care, if mental health resources are not easily available, I think that when you first integrate I'm, I'm believing that you tend to see the patients who have like the most need, right? And we're screening for it. And so we tend to see a lot of mental health uh, issues in, a, in our clinic. Um, we try to use cognitive behavioral therapy, psychoeducation, motivational interviewing, you name it, um, really focusing on self-care, functional improvement, symptom reduction. We might draw upon these different strategies. And sometimes we have to bridge, right, with sending the patient to the higher level of care, making sure that Sometimes we'll say, okay, let's set this appointment. And maybe we can see you once until you get there. Make sure that you're okay. Um, trying to help serve as that link. One of the things that I use a lot of is brief action planning. And this is something that we teach when we precept as well. We teach the primary care providers this too to, to end their sessions with, so oh, what's one change or one thing you'd like to work on? Like based on what we've been talking about in the next week or two, we really kind of help patients narrow it down in a, in a smart way, um, accepting their confidence. So it's, it's, it's a, we, we talk about sort of using the spirit of motion, motivational interviewing in this problem solving and trying to shift one of the practice changes that we are working toward is, is getting patients to be more um, tuned to self-management. This is a, an example of what that looks like. So I'm going to, um, so I've included just some examples of different things. Um, you know, what are some things that we might do for depression, right? What are some of the common um, interventions, but again, that psychoeducation about the disorder and its treatment, options for medication management. I always ask patients, like, what were you thinking that you wanted, right? So depression is a disease. We can usually treat it with either medication or behavioral interventions. For some people, the combination of both works really, works best. What would you like to do? And we can sort of talk through what they're, um, but occasionally, you know, I might have a recommendation. But in this case, we really think medication would be helpful for you. Um, what are some of your barriers to that? Right, so just even having that conversation initially, I think, can be helpful, and then we might draw upon any of those skills. And so, again, that's similar for the cases of these other things. And I'm just going to, for the sake of time, flip through some of those. I wanted to just briefly touch on this idea that, you know, there might be some unique issues that present themselves, like, ethically when you're practicing in this different setting. And one of them is that, you know, AMA and APA codes sometimes conflict. Um, you know, especially about um, dual roles or boundary conflicts, um, how much you, th those kinds of things. And so sometimes, you know, you're, there's, um, and, and boundary conflicts sort of abound, especially we work with, you know, the providers who we might work with have like the medic, the, you know, might also have their primary care there. And so what is that to, to now be providing some therapy services to somebody you also work with or for somebody's, you know, the husband and the wife? Right, so we, we try to shift that among the team members, but those kinds of things present themselves a lot. You know, our patients, when we pop into a room, are they consenting to treatment with us? That's something that we've done a lot of thinking around. Um, you know, um, is, is somebody talking to us and they also have a therapist on the outside? What's an appropriate amount? How do we terminate? A lot of different issues that come up. But I'm going to stop there and um, talk to Isha. Isha, how, how have things been with us with the chat? Great. Someone was asking if we could pass along your email, and I just want to make sure that's okay with you. Absolutely. Please, and feel free to ask me any questions, too, um, afterward. I just I was sort of leading this last 
slide, oops, I can stop sharing. I forget to do that. <laughs> um, this last slide is just some of the selected, selected references that I thought might be particularly helpful. Um, and when I talked about the Hunter and Goody book here, um, that has a lot of um, handouts um, specifically for um, operating in primary care. This Brief Interventions for Radical Change is Strozel's book that talks more about how to utilize um, focused acceptance and commitment therapy and then motivational injury in healthcare. I think we, I use that a lot. And, and these are some of the places that um, I, Dr. Williams's article, the Society for Health, Self, Health Psychology series, the UMass um, training that I did, um, and then the SAMHSA site has a lot of information. As well. So I'm happy to, to share this as well. We do have one question, Dr. Beckman. Someone asked, um, I would love to hear if Dr. Beckman has any guidance or advice for early career psychologists who are interested in re-specializing in health psych and how that might happen. Um, so an early career, I, you know, I'm wanting to stop share, but I hope that you're okay if I don't stop share because it's going to take me a second to figure out. Um, no worries. <laughs> um, so for an early career, early career psychologist, so you're finished with your postdoc and you're thinking, I want to do this. And I think that's that's very, um, within primary care specifically, um, I, so I can kind of use my example. I, I, I had an interest in, um, so, you know, more specific or formalized training programs and integrated primary care did not exist, right, when I was going through graduate school and in my training. Um, I do have a health psych background. So I think, um, are we talking about somebody who has like their general background, maybe like depression, anxiety, or some other kind of psychopathology moving toward more of a health psych, or is this health psych to, to specializing in primary care? Um, I, so I don't know that, but um, I had some health psych experiences over time, um, you know, through my training and other things. And that's part of the reason I took Alexander Blount's course. Um, you know, really sort of utilizing the, there's trainings at ABCT every year, there's different trainings that you can to, to help um, these books <laughs> that um, we recommend. Um, I think that, that that's a good overview as well. Um, AP, joining like Division 38, health psychology, these kinds of things, I think that there's a lot of possibility for training on site. And then, and so when I think about somebody who might be even further back, one of the differences is, um, you know, seeking mentorship, finding somebody who's willing to mentor you and, and help. Um, I think that there's a lot of um, resources within, especially Division 38, if you're looking to, to move toward more of a health psych focus. I think, you know, from what I've, colleagues tend to be super open and welcoming and very happy and receptive to supporting other people. Um, you know, we all want to share our knowledge and help lift the people up behind, under who are behind us. Um, so. I think that that could be, um, those are some options. Um, we have two more, one general question. Would you be willing to share your slides? Yes. So you can email myself or Zoe and we can pass it along. Um, thank you. And then I don't know if we have time. We have one more question. I don't know if you can address it. What are some of the most common techniques that residents and family medicine docs can learn from us that they find most helpful in clinic when a mental health provider is not available? Uh-huh. Um, so I think the when we talk about, I think when I say that I, some of the trainings that we did, the basic communication, right? So even just giving people just that idea of not being afraid of crying, right? And, and that people have emotions. And so I think I do a lot of just teaching them like reflective listening, right? So acknowledging what comes up for you at the same time, but knowing that when somebody's really upset or when somebody's really sad, that, that you stopping for a second to listen to the person. So, you know, providing reflection, asking, you know, what's going on, <laughs> right? Like I can see that you're crying, what's, what's going on? Do you, do you care to talk about this with me? Um, just to ask, right? Um, so asking perhaps an open-ended question or something like that. So I, I, I think sometimes that's why I include the motivational interviewing. I, I really, I encourage people like the basic ors, trying to use um, a spirit of respect where you're respecting this patient, you're trying to collaborate with them and, um, you know, being present in the moment for those kinds of things. I think so it's just, um, 
And the other thing I think I talk about the most, if I'm going to say too, is, is just non-stigmatizing assessment of mental health. And so, you know, being able to ask questions about a person's sexual functioning or being able to ask questions about depression, as, and I often ask them to do that, you know, as part of like their general system review, you know, not to say, you know, or to include stress on a differential, you know, so these are some things that I think could be going on with you and include stress in there, right? So we're trying to find ways to incorporate um, the idea that mental health can make a difference um, even when we're not there and it, it tends to be better received when we're practicing, when we're listening, when we're engaging in some of those basic um, communication skills. I hope, I hope that helps. I hope that answers the question. It sounds really basic. I think those are all of the questions so far. So thank you so much, Dr. Beckman. Um, and we will pass along your slides. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. It was great. Thank you all so much for, for joining us today. I hope that that was helpful. Take care. Thanks, Dr. Beckman. Well, thank you. Thank you.